Euclid is the next great mathematician in line after Pythagoras to gain notoriety. He is proposed to have lived in Alexandria during the first half of the third century, under the reign of Ptolemy I. For very little is known about his life or what he was like. It's assumed that he probably studied for a while at Plato's Academy in Athens, but the museum and an academy in Alexandria, with the help of the famous Library of Alexandria, had become just as prestigious, and he most likely finished his studies there. Although little was left behind in terms of knowledge on Euclid's life, what is known is that he created arguably one of the most important mathematical texts of all time. Euclid's greatest text, Elements, was written sometime around 300 BC. Our knowledge of most Greek mathematical works before Euclid comes from this text. The real genius of the elements lies not in what his own contributions to the text are, but in how he was able to combine and arrange all important past Greek mathematical facts. It consisted of 13 books um, where he included all previous mathematical knowledge and some of his own discoveries. He combined it into one complete, systematic, well-organized form. The ideas are presented in a logical and direct way, with the theorem followed by its proof um, all completed with only a compass and a straight edge. The first book begins with a short list of definitions, five postulates and five common notions. Modern mathematicians would call the postulates and common notions axioms. Things or ideas that are well known or have been proven. The five postulates are, are or geometrical constructions are as follows. Postulate one, it is possible to draw a straight line from any point to any point. Postulate 2, it is possible to extend a fine straight line continuously in a straight line, meaning a line segment can be extended past either of its endpoints to form an arbitrary line segment. Po postulate 3, it is possible to describe a circle with any center and a distance. And postulate 4, all right angles are equal to one another. And postulate 5, if a straight line falling on two straight lines makes the interior, make the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles, then the two straight lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on that side on which the angles are less than the two right angles. Among the many important mathematical models presented in the elements, there were formulas for finding the volumes of solids like cones, pyramids, and cylinders, proofs on geometric series, perfect numbers, and prime numbers, algorithms for finding the GCD, or greatest common divisor, and least common multiple for two numbers, a proof on the Pythagorean theorem and a proof that there is an infinite number of Pythagorean triples, construction of a regular pentagon, and the definitive proof that there are only five regular platonic solids. The text elements is the basis for what is now modern Euclidean geometry. Euclid's proof of the Pythagorean theorem, which unlike most proofs in this text, is actually attributed to himself, is one we are familiar with today. The theorem says that in a right-angled triangle, the squares on the sides subtending the right angle is equal to the squares on the sides containing the right angle. If we have a triangle ABC with the angle C equal to 90 degrees, we can then construct squares off of the triangle. We can draw an altitude CF and lines DB and CE, and we can see that triangle DAB is equal to triangle CAE. We can see that the square ACGD is twice that of triangle DAB because they have the same base AD, and they have the same height as they are between two parallel lines, DA and GB. The rectangle AEFH is twice triangle CAE, for they too have the same base, AE, and have the same height as they are between two parallel lines, FC and EA. Since triangle CAE is equal to triangle DAB, then AEFH is equal to ACGD. If we draw the lines CJ and IA, we can see that triangle IBA is equal to triangle CBJ. The square CBIK is twice that of triangle IBA because they have the same base, BI, 
and have the same height as they are between two parallel lines, IB and AK. The rectangle HBJF is twice the triangle GBC, for they have the same base, BJ, and have the same height as they are between two parallel lines. Since triangle IBA is equal to triangle CBJ, then HBJF is equal to CBIK. So we have that AC squared plus BC squared is equal to AB, AB squared. The elements also mark the first introduction to number theory with its inclusion of properties of numbers and integers. Euclid was the first to prove that there are infinite, infinitely many primes. The basis of his proof, which is often referred to as Euclid's theorem, is that for any given set of primes, if you multiply all of them together and then add one, then a new set of primes has been added to the set, and this process can be repeated indefinitely. Euclid was the first to prove that would become known as the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, or the unique factorization theorem. This was also the first known proof to use proof by contradiction. His theorem states that every positive integer n is either a prime or can be expressed as the product of primes. This representation is unique, apart from the order in which the factors occur. If an integer n is greater than 1, it is either prime or composite. If, if n is prime, we have our factorization. If n is composite, then we can write n as the product of a prime number and another integer n1. n1 then can either be prime or composite. If n1 is prime, we once again have our factorization. But if n1 is composite, we can once again write it as the product of a prime and of an integer n2. The cycle continues, but cannot continue indefinitely, as we get a decreasing sequence of n's approaching 1. So we must have a finite number of steps, nk, and at that point, nk must be prime and equal to pk. This gives us a prime factorization. The second part of the proof deals with the uniqueness of prime factorization. Suppose we say that the prime factorization of an integer can be written in two ways. One way, um, where pi is equal to all primes and qi equal to all primes, both in increasing order. We can say that p is a divisor of qi, q1 through qs, all, and therefore is a factor of some qk for some k. Since qk is prime, it has only two factors, one in itself. But p1 is greater than one and a factor of qk, so we must assume that p1 is equal to qk. Then it must be that p1 is greater than or equal to qk. If we then assume that q1 is a factor of p1, p2, all the way up to pr, uh, we can then say that q1 must be a factor of some pk for some k. Since pk is a prime, it only has two factors, one in itself. But q1 is greater than one and a factor of pk, so we must assume that q1 is equal to pk. Then it must be that q1 is greater than or equal to pk. We can see from both of these results that p1 must equal q1. If we cancel out each common factor, continually using these results, we should arrive at one is equal to qr, one is equal to qr plus one qr plus two qr plus until qs because of the equality that r is less than s. But this is impossible since we know that q1 is greater than one. This is a contradiction, so r must equal s, meaning that the two factorizations of n are actually identical. P1 then must equal Q1, P2 must equal Q2, and so on. This finishes up our section on Euclid and the results from his text, The Elements. Thanks for watching this video in our series on the history of Greek math mathematics. Click the links here to watch the next video in our playlist, watch the full playlist, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.